I'm happy to introduce Karen Rubin. She's going to talk about algorithmic trading. Um, please give a hand for Karen. Thank you. Good? Uh, thank you very much. So I'm here today to talk about building a quantitative trading strategy. But more than that, I'm here to tell you a story about the first trading strategy I wrote and about the mistakes and the journey that I've been on for the last year and a half. Hopefully it'll make it easier for everybody here who wants to get started doing the same. Before I dive into that, I have to tell you, I am not providing investment advice. Do not listen to me for investment advice. Nothing I say should be construed as investment advice. Uh, I'm the VP of product at a company called Quantopian. Quantopian has a platform that lets people uh, write, trade, research, and test strategies to invest in the market. We have a community of just under 80,000 users who are doing this all the time. They work together, they work individually. All of the code that they write to invest in the market's their own, and then we identify the best strategies and make allocations to those strategies, and the algo author gets a percent of the profit. I started at Quantopian, uh, they don't get a percent of the profit, they get a a more than, they get 10% of the profit. I'm allowed to say that, I think. Uh, in any case, <laughs> uh, I started at Quantopian almost two years ago, and I'm a product manager. What that means for me is I have a degree in computer science, but I've never traded, I've never written code professionally. I've been in product at the point I started at Quantopian for 10 years. I built marketing software, I built social media software, I've built commerce software and content production software, but I have never worked in the world of building financial trading platforms, I've never traded a strategy, I've never worked with quants. So I came into this job having to work with my engineers to build a platform to do something I've never done. And so as a product manager, one of the first things I needed to do was write a strategy to invest in the market so that I could understand what my users were doing and how they were gonna use the platform and what their, their workflow was and what their challenges were. And so I took a deep breath and I spent a bunch of time trying to figure out what I was gonna do. What strategy would I write to invest in the market? What would my thesis be? And it actually took me a couple of months to figure out what that should be. And so this is the journey of figuring that out and writing this strategy. And as a product manager, I do a lot of research in my users, and the research that I do informs the product that we build, but then also the product that we build, in this particular instance, was also able to inform the strategy that I created. And so it's been a really interesting back and forth cycle of a year and, and, a, year and a half, and in some ways I consider this strategy the gift that keeps on giving, because every time we build something new, I have this epiphany where I'm like, oh my God, that works for my strategy. And then uh, we are building something for the product, and I'm like, I know why that's painful for the user. So it's been a lot of fun to just understand who my users are and get back to writing code and building a strategy to invest in the market. So the first thing I had to do was figure out what it was gonna be. And I spent a bunch of time thinking about different things, and then Credit Suisse came out with their Gender 3000 report. And this was in late 2013, and the Gender 3000 report took a look at 3,000 companies across 40 countries, and it looked at how gender was reflected in those organizations. And as of 2013, women were 12.9% of top management, and they were on 12.7% of boards. Now, I, I don't think these numbers are abysmal, but they're probably not surprising. Uh, we all know that this is a problem. <laughs> And the numbers that I, the charts that I liked a little bit more was this, which shows the global performance of companies. Uh, the gray line is companies with one or more women on their board, and the blue line is companies with no women on their board. That's interesting. Uh, this is performance, again, tiered by percentage of the, the management team that's female. So the purple line at the top is 50% women, gray is 33, blue is 25, and yellow is all companies. And so these two charts got me to be asking the question, what if you invested in female CEOs? I wanted a strategy that was simple to implement. I wasn't gonna be doing deep statistical analysis to try and look at market movements or momentum strategies. And I thought I could do something where when a female CEO came in to the position of CEO, I bought a stock, and when she left the position, I sold. Super simple strategy. <laughs> Right back to coding for the first time in 10 years, I thought even I could figure this one out. 
Uh, now our platform has a couple of online tools and it gives a lot of data to our users. It has pricing data, historical pricing data back to 2002. I'll explain in a minute why that matters. And then it also has fundamental data, which is everything that a company reports on their 10K or their 10Q. Those are their annual and quarterly reports and it's 600 data points per company per quarter. None of those are gender. So of the CEO or anybody else in the organization. And so the first thing I needed was to get some companies that had female CEOs and understand what they were. And it was important that I had that historically. So if I took a look today at the female CEOs and just looked back at how those companies had performed, it wouldn't necessarily reflect the performance of the CEOs in position. I wanted to invest in companies when they actually had a female CEO. So I went to every researcher's trusted uh, research partner, Google, and Googled historical female CEO lists and actually found a nonprofit catalyst that is focused on putting women into, helping women in positions of, of business. And they have a historical report they put out every year, and it's um, the bottom line report. It identifies all of the CEOs in the Fortune 1000 that are women. And it goes back 10 or 20 years. So every single year, they look at all of the companies in the Fortune 1000 and they say, who are the female CEOs? And I reached out to them and asked them if they would share it with me, and they were very willing to, and they sent me a PDF. And so I manually copied from the PDF <laughs> into my spreadsheet all of the female CEOs from 12 years and what company they worked at. That's the first two columns that you can see over here. And then what I actually needed was the ticker symbol of those companies and the CEO's start and end date because my strategy was buy when they started, sell when they ended. And so I manually went through all the CEOs and Googled for all of this information. I then actually used Mechanical Turk and I sent it out and I got two other people to verify every single one of these data points to understand if I had the data correct. Um, and at the end of doing all of this, I had 80 female CEOs in 74 companies. So from the period of 2002 to the end of 2014, there were 80 female CEOs uh, in the Fortune 1000. And that was across 74 companies because some companies have multiple female CEOs. And so now that I had this data, I pulled it into our research platform, which is a hosted IPython platform. And I did a lot of this work in our research platform entirely because it was the platform we were building at the time. I'm a product manager. I was trying to understand how to make it better. And so I did a lot of work within that and learned how to use IPython and, or Jupyter and understood how, what I was doing from there. And so this, this chart shows all of the, the number of new CEOs every single year. And you'll see, I would argue, that this trend is going in the right direction, up and to the right. Uh, you'll, you might also notice, although the font might be too small, this goes back to before 2002. Dates are really important in this, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, my simulation that I'm gonna run starts at the beginning of 2002 and goes through the end of 2014. But I have the female CEOs that were CEOs in 2002. So they might have started prior to that, but on the first day of my simulation, they were CEOs and I buy those companies as well. So these are the 80, 80 females that we were looking at. To take a step back and explain what my simulation is, what I'm running here is called a back test. So it's a historical simulation that looks back in history and says, if I were trading this, this strategy on the market, what would the performance have been? And it actually marches on through history making buy and sell decisions as if it were actually trading in the market. And that's why it's important that there's data back to 2002 at the minute level for every security that traded on the US equity market for those 12 years. And what my first pass at this strategy, the most basic version that I ran did, is every single day, starting from January 2nd, 2002, which is the first trading day of 2002, it asks a couple questions. It says first, are there any CEOs that started today? And if the answer is yes, it buys 500 shares of that company. Then it says, did any CEOs end today? And if it says yes, it sells everything that I had for that company. It then moves on to the next day. And my strategy marches on through history, making buy and sell decisions using historical data as if it were actually trading in the market during that time period. So this is a look at how many positions I hold at any point during my strategy. You'll notice at the beginning in 2002, during that year, I hold about eight different companies. And by the end of my strategy, I hold 40 to 50. And so the number of female CEOs that are actually working in the Fortune 1000 grows over time and my portfolio gets larger. This is the meat of the code of the algorithm, this very first pass that I did. The first thing it does is it gets today's date. Now, that's not today's date. That's the date in my strategy, so the date of the simulation. 
It then goes back to that CEO list that I showed you, and it identifies were there any CEOs that started today, were there any CEOs that ended today, and it iterates through two loops. This first loop is just basically buying everything. So it goes through that start list, it identifies the companies that are there, and then it orders target right here. And what that does is it basically says, make, get me into a position of 500 shares in this company. And then that function basically takes care of making that happen. The next for loop here is basically ending today. And so it goes through that list, does the same thing, and it sends an order target for zero. So it says, no matter what I owned, get me to zero, get me out. And this is the meat of my strategy. Now, before I actually got to this point, there are a couple of things I had to do. Uh, I wrote this strategy up, this, even for somebody who had not done any coding in 10 years, this was code I could understand. This was basically pretty simple, a couple of for loops, some pandas, which I had to learn. And the first couple times I ran this, the first couple times, the first tens of times I ran this, it just crashed and I kept getting errors. And it turns out there's a couple of interesting things about dates and trading strategies. So I had gone to Google and I'd gotten the start and end date for all of these CEOs. And something that's different about a CEO of a Fortune 1000 company from you or I is they don't start their job two weeks after quitting their last job on the next Monday. They start on the first of the month or the first of the quarter or the first of the year. Doesn't matter if that day is a weekend or a holiday. Doesn't matter if they actually go to work on that day. It does not matter if it's a trading day. And so I kept running into these situations where I was trying to buy and sell things on days that didn't exist and I was not buying and selling what I thought I was gonna buy. And I realized I had to do some work to cleanse these dates to make sure that I was looking for the nearest trading date of all the CEOs. The other spectacular thing uh, about working in the world of finance that I don't think I knew before I started this uh, is ticker symbols aren't unique. They're reused, because that makes sense. So the, <laughs> the best example of this is actually TWTR. Uh, if you go buy TWTR today, you're gonna get a share of Twitter, right? But if back in the late 90s or early 2000s you buy TWTR, you're going to get a share of Twitter home entertainment. And if you are a child of the 90s like I am, you know that that was a stereo system company. And so you do not want TWTR that was sold back then, you want what's now. So in any case, you have to match the date of the CEO to the symbol to get what's called a security identifier, which is the unique thing. So after doing, I think in the early part of this, I probably spent 30% of my time just cleansing the data, something all researchers probably understand, and that was the gender dates, just making sure it was clean and it was actually what I wanted to do. So I'm at work someday, I've probably, looking back, it feels like it was weeks and weeks trying to just get to the first point where I could run this back test and get my first version. Um, I've got the data clean, I've got everything working, and I press go on my back test, and it actually runs, and I don't get an error, and this is what my return chart looks like. Uh, so this is my strategy, investing in 500 shares of the Fortune 1000 female CEOs. Um, it was probably about eight o'clock at night. Put yourself in my position, you've all been there, you're working on writing some code, it has not been working, you're frustrated, and it finally runs. I mic dropped, I walked out of the office, I went home, pat myself on the back, thought I was a rock star. My strategy went up and to the right. I work in startups. Up and to the right is always good. <laughs> and it wasn't until about three o'clock in the morning that I realized, I don't actually know what this means. And does it beat the market? Is this good? Like, great, it went up and to the right, but this isn't telling me anything. And so the next day I come back to work and I get some help putting it against a benchmark. So this is the strategy, the first strategy of the Fortune 1000 female CEOs as uh, compared to the S&P 500. And in this particular scenario, it outperforms by 389%. Now, that sounds awesome, but how many of you write bug-free code on the first shot? Yeah, I thought there might be a few of you. I don't do that very often. Um, and so what I did was, and being the fact that I'd never done this before, I went to our in-house quant, the guy that has actually written strategies to invest in the market before, and I said, Justin, am I, I mean, am I amazing? Should I quit my job? Like, tell me what. <laughs> what's going on here? And he said, Karen, what's your leverage? And I said, my what? <laughs> now, leverage is a wonderful little thing. When you're trading with a brokerage, uh, you can lever up your portfolio. And what that means is they'll lend you money to increase your buying power. So say you have $1,000, you can lever up six times, and now you've got $6,000. And you pay interest on the money you borrow, but in theory, if you're really good at what you do, you're gonna make more money because you've invested more money. And so Justin helped me figure out how to look at my leverage. And this is what my leverage chart looked like. 
Uh, you might not be able to see those very small numbers, but basically what's happening here is my strategy is plugging on through history. It hits 2008. I borrow 200 times my portfolio. I lose 400 times my portfolio. I borrow 800 times my portfolio. I lose 600 times my portfolio. This would never happen in uh, reality. No brokerage would lend you 800 times your portfolio, and especially after you had lost a lot of money already. So I had to go back and rethink my strategy. And what he talked to me about was rebalancing your portfolio and not buying 500 shares of every company, because 500 shares in you know, Berkshire Hathaway is not the same as 500 shares in a penny stock like Joe's Jeans. So the new strategy goes on through history, starts at the very beginning, looks if any female CEOs start and it buys. Looks for, I'm sorry, it doesn't buy, it puts them on a buy list. Uh, gets any female CEOs that end on that day and it puts them on a sell list. It then rebalances my portfolio. And in order to do this, it takes a look at how many companies are my holding at this point. It takes a look at what my portfolio value is. It divides the value by the number of companies in my portfolio, and then it invests the same value per company. So if I have $1,000 and 10 companies, I'm going to invest $100 in each company. And then it marches on through history, doing the same strategy every day. And every time I invest in another company, it rebalances my portfolio. So as the number of companies I'm investing in grows, the percentage of my portfolio that each company represents diminishes. So here's the way that that code looks. And again, um, I've got my buy sell lists at the top. I make sure there's something to do today. So this is, do I have anything in my stocks to order today or my stocks to sell today? Here's the important thing on this one, I sell first. So this loop is my sell loop, and I've moved that up at the front. <laughs> so I sell out of the things I want to get out of, and then I recalculate my current stocks to be, what are the companies that I want to get into, what's left in my portfolio, and that current stocks counter gives me the number of positions that I've got in my portfolio at this point. And the last for loop here is getting me into the companies and rebalancing. And so what I do here is you'll see the logic right here where it says calculate the value to buy. Um, I get my portfolio value, I identify the number of stocks, my value to buy is the portfolio value over the number of stocks, and then I do order target value right here, which is basically whatever the stock is and the value to buy. And what this function does is it makes sure if I already own some proportion of a company and I need to get more, it just gets me a little bit more, and if I need to get less, it just gets me a little bit less. So as opposed to selling everything and then buying it all again, it just rebalances to make sure I have the right value. So when I run this version of my strategy, here's what it looks like against the S&P 500. My algorithm investing in the female CEOs of the Fortune 1000 returns 339% for an outperformance of 217% over the S&P 500. So being a novice quant, I'm still pretty happy with these returns. I would take 200% returns in the market. I'm not sure about you, um, but that would be great. Uh, but I also, like, I don't know what I don't know. So I went to the community at this point and I published these results to share and get some feedback. Um, as you can imagine, there was some response. Uh, <laughs> it ended up in Hacker News and Fortune wrote about it and I got tons of great feedback. I presented it at a bunch of algorithmic trading meetups and talked with real quants that have done this before and got their questions and got their feedback and worked to incorporate it. it was, it's been the best learning process I've gone through to understand what these people actually do, these people, my users, what a quant does. Um, oh, I should back up, leverage here. We should reevaluate leverage again. This is my leverage of this strategy. You'll see it hovers around one. That basically means I'm not borrowing anything. So I shared this with the community and got their feedback, and I want to now talk through some of the, the questions I got. And I will tell you straight off the bat, people were unbelievably uh, helpful and just great in giving me support on this and asking really reasonable questions, and it's helped me further everything I've done. The first thing, um, and interesting, remember, this is in 2015 I'm doing this. It's not today. However, I continue to get this question. Um, could it be Yahoo and Alibaba? Is this just Yahoo? And the reason this is a good question is here's a look at Yahoo stock price during the 12-year scenario that I'm looking at. Um, it had, they have two female CEOs, Carol Bartz. The blue arrows here represent when a female CEO come, leaves the position um, and enters the position. So Carol leaves it here, and then Marissa, I'm sorry, Carol starts here, leaves here, Marissa starts there. So you could look at this and be like, well, Marissa clearly is an exceptional CEO. The stock price of Yahoo has done nothing but go up and up and up since she started. 
I'm not going to make any comments on that. But <laughs> if you know anything about Yahoo, what actually happened here is Yahoo had made early on a little investment in a company called Alibaba. And Alibaba IPO'd here. And Alibaba had a spectacular IPO. And so as Alibaba's stock price went up and up and up, Yahoo's did the same thing because everybody knew Yahoo had this big stake in Alibaba. And so the theory here is your, my strategy does very well during these times when Yahoo's doing well. Obviously, I own Yahoo. Maybe it's just the fact that Yahoo's doing really well. And the beautiful thing is removing Yahoo from my strategy takes two lines of code. I remove Yahoo from the initial CEO data frame I'm doing, um, and my strategy now returns 320%. So the strategy goes down with Yahoo. Yahoo has a positive impact on the overall returns here, but it's not the entire reason for the overall returns. And the reason comes back to this chart. So remember, this chart is how much of every, how many companies I'm holding each year. And uh, when I'm holding Yahoo and it's dealing with Alibaba, it's over here where I've got 40 or 50 companies. So it's 1 40th of my portfolio. It doesn't, it's not the entire strategy. So the next thing that people brought up that was also great was what about sector bias? And the idea here is that you could have all of your companies in one sector. That sector does very well for reasons that are not because they have female CEOs or anything else. And really what you're just investing in is an outperformance of that one sector. So I took the Morningstar fundamental sector codes for all of these companies, and this is a chart plotting those very sector codes and the number of companies in my 80, uh, in my 74 companies by sector. And you will notice there is one outlier. And in fact, 30% of my companies that have female CEOs are in the consumer sector. So during this 12 year period, did the consumer sector do fabulously well? And my portfolio just returns really well because of the consumer sector. So this gets a little more complicated. What I need to do is create a sector neutral strategy. So in the second version of my portfolio, what we did was we made it so that we invested the same amount in each company that was in my portfolio. Now what we wanna do is make sure we invest the same amount in each sector. So what I do here is I get my list of CEOs and I identify how many sectors am I going to be invested in at any given point in my, at this given point in my strategy. I then identify again my portfolio value here and I get the value per sector, which is just the portfolio value divided by the sector, the number of sectors. I then identify for every sector that I'm currently invested in how many, of, how many companies are in that sector. And when I do my buy logic, now I've just clipped out the part where I'm doing this the rebalancing. I've already sold out of everything that I wanna sell out of in this day. When I do my buy logic, I basically say, get the companies, get the company's current sector, identify how many companies are in that sector, and then my value to buy is the value per sector over the number of companies in the sector. So if you will, say we've got a strategy, at this point in my strategy, I'm in two different sectors. One of them has three companies, and one of them has 10 companies. They would each get 50% of my portfolio allocated to the sector, but the companies within, the, where there are only three companies in the sector, each get one third of what's allocated to that sector, and the companies in the sector that has 10 each get one tenth. So the companies will have different amounts invested in them. Every sector will have the same amount, which should neutralize any outperformance in any given sector. So when we take a look at this strategy, my algorithm uh, outperforms the S&P 500 still by 153%. And so the consumer sector did actually perform very well during this time period. The female, 30% of my, company, my companies were in the consumer sector, and so you see that reflected here. But again, it's not a slam dunk that that's the only reason why my strategy does quite well. And so you can see that what I'm doing here is I'm trying to systematically go through all of the objections people give me to essentially disprove my own strategy. I've got this theory. I think if you invest in female CEOs, something interesting is gonna happen, but before I put any money into it, I wanna make sure I'm right. So then the next question that I got a lot is that the S&P 500 is the wrong benchmark. So the S&P 500 is the SPY, those are the same things. Um, it's considered to be one of the best representations of the US stock market at any given point in time. The S&P 500, uh, in order to, every year they evaluate all of the companies in the market and they use, I don't know, 10 or 12 different uh, numbers, and then a room full of people decide which companies get in and which companies get out. Uh, they then stack rank them by market cap and put the biggest, largest portion of the index is in the biggest company, smallest portion of the index is in the smallest company. So it's a market cap weighted index, which basically means large companies account for a greater portion of the index. My strategy is an equal weighted strategy. 
So they're not exactly apples to apples. And so the theory here is that I'm just not comparing it to something that's equivalent because big companies just have more weight in the S&P 500. So I could go and create, like we did with the sector, one a, a market neutral, market cap neutral, market cap weighted version of my portfolio. But instead I went and I found um, RSP, which is an equal weighted S&P 500 ETF. Guggenheim basically gets the list of all of the companies in the S&P 500 every year, and it creates an equal weighted version of the S&P 500, and that's what I'm doing here. So the green line's my algorithm, the red line is the RSP, the blue line is the S&P 500. Um, RSP is much more, it's much closer to my strategy. Um, this is a better benchmark. You'll also notice the RSP doesn't actually start trading until 2004, hence the flat line here at the beginning. Um, so it wasn't around for the entire time of my strategy. But from this point forward, I actually started using the RSP as my benchmark because it made sense to me that this was a better benchmark. A lot of people did say, well, Karen, you're sort of saying the female CEOs of the Fortune 1000 are a better investment than the rest of the Fortune 1000. Wouldn't a better investment be the rest of the Fortune 1000? Which is a very good question. Um, unfortunately, Fortune sells their Fortune 1000 lists uh, for lots and lots and lots of money. And I have not been able to afford getting that, but I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to replicate that, and we'll come back to that in a few minutes. The other piece of feedback that I got uh, from a lot of this is that my sample size is too small. There aren't enough female CEOs. Yes, I agree. <laughs> for, uh, for much of the time period since I've been working on this, that was the feedback that I gave to people. You're right, there aren't, let's change that. <laughs> but uh, what has also happened is I went about trying to find a, a bigger data set. I, what I found from Catalyst was just the Fortune 1000 female CEOs, but obviously, well, it's, it's a, only a portion of the market. On any given day, there are about 8,000 securities trading in the U.S. equity market, and I'm only looking at a portion, uh, one eighth of those. So what if I looked at the broader market? And this is one of those examples where um, our product was continuing to evolve, things were continuing to happen, and then I had various aha moments when I realized that I could do one more thing. Um, we created a data marketplace. And so we have Morningstar fundamentals data and pricing data, and then somebody else at my company was working on integrating all of this other data. And at some point, I realized that he had CEO changes from Eventvestor. And I went to him and I, I'm, I might have been a little bit excited. I think I jumped up and down and I shook him and I was like, does this have gender? And he actually had to go back and ask them because gender wasn't one of the columns that they normally provided, but they do have gender. And so this data set's a really interesting data set. It has, um, from 2007 to today, it has over 4,000 CEO change events, which means they identify when a CEO changes in an organization. Um, they give you information like, is it an interim change? Is it a permanent change? Were they hired from within? Were they hired from without? And what is their gender, as well as their name? Um, and so over the time period, I have 175 incoming female CEOs and 97 outgoing female CEOs, so it is a much larger pool to draw from. Now, one of the nice things here is all of the data is simple. I remember I talked about how I had to do all that data cleansing for my data that I scraped off the internet. It was all taken care of for me here. So it was all mapped, it was all correct dates. It was much, much lovely, much nicer to work with. Um, and so I took that and uh, it also, it was nice because it was kind of a coming together of two things. This was a pipeline API that I got to work on um, with one of our engineers, which allows you to evaluate all 8,000 stocks on any given day against all the data we've got. And so all I had to do to incorporate this into, I basically wrote a new strategy. I didn't incorporate it into my same female CEO strategy. I shared it over with the same premise was I basically identify that I want the in-CEO gender, so what's the CEO gender of coming in to start in the position, and I wanna know the effective date. They give you two dates. There's the date you learn about this and can trade on the information, and then there's also the, the date that it actually becomes effective. I thought the effective date was more apples to apples with my female Fortune 1000 strategy, so I was using that. And then I set a screen to remove anything where the gender is ambiguous and they don't know what it is. So I just sort of ignore all of those for my strategy. Um, my ordering logic, um, this is actually to get my stocks to order today list and my stocks to close today list. The one interesting thing I have to do here is be, to deal with that effective date, which can again be on a Saturday or a Sunday or a non-trading day. I took a, a time delta of seven days. Um, and I, seven's a pretty arbitrary number. I just said a week, sounds rational. Um, that'll get me around any major events. Uh, and it, just through testing, it looked like it worked pretty well. 
So my CEOs of starting today are anybody where today's events, which are events that happened in the last seven days, um, have an in sender of context at gender, which in this case is set to female. Um, I then get my portfolio and I say, were there any events that happened today that were for companies in my portfolio? And that's important because if one of the companies is going from a female CEO to a female CEO, I don't need to exit. Um, but if it goes from a female CEO to a male CEO, I did want to sell. So I get my list of CEOs ending today by removing those. And then I get my two lists of CEOs ordering today and CEOs closing today. And from there, the actual ordering logic is exactly the same. I sell everything, I figure out how many companies I'm, I want to hold, and then I buy it in a balanced way. Um, I go back to just a market, uh, an equal weighted strategy here, so it's not the sector version I showed last. Um, it's just looking at all the companies. When I do that, here's the blue line is uh, my new algorithm using the event vester data set. That's the blue line. The green line is the Fortune 1000 strategy over the same time period. The red is the RSP. Now the time on this changes. The event investor data starts in 2007. So that's why you'll notice that there's a big difference in the returns from my Fortune 1000 strategy to this. I had to rerun that with just the limited data to be able to have a benchmark. Um, there's also some interesting things you'll hear notice like what is going on here? Like there's a big up and a big down. My first thought was something must be wrong with the data. Um, turns out there's one big difference between this event investor data set and my Fortune 1000 data set. Uh, this only reports on CEO changes, which means when I start my portfolio, I have nothing because it doesn't know about all the CEOs coming into my strategy that are women. And so for the first two years here, I have less than 10 companies in my portfolio. And so when you look here, the big up is actually a pharmaceutical company, a bioscience company that got acquired by Bristol Myers. A couple weeks before it happened, the news got out and its stock price quadrupled. The big down there, that's October 2008. So my strategy is not uh, neutral to market fluctuations. Um, and it's just this, this is a small you know, sample size early on, um, but it does grow over time. So then uh, the next thing that happened is time passed. I work on this in fits and bursts. I'll dive into it for a month at a time and play with my strategy and learn more about our users. And then I come away and I go do my real day job. And then I come back to this and play with it some more. And over the course of, the other the thing that happened was I had the report from Catalyst that ended at the end of 2014, and I had to wait till the end of 2015 to get new data from them on the Fortune 1000 CEOs for 2015. And I talked to a lot of people about trying to get the data on my own and looking at different things, but I just never did it. And so all of a sudden, I realized that I had out of sample data. And if you do any kind of research, out of sample data is very important. It's no different when you're uh, looking at algorithms to invest in the market. Um, this is not my strategy. This is a different strategy shared with our community um, where the user did a two-year back test and they were using machine learning actually to come up with this strategy. And look at, I mean, it performs wonderfully. Wouldn't you like to be invested in this strategy? No volatility, up all the way, like this is wonderful. And then they put it into some um, paper trading, which is trading against real market data with play money. And then they put it into some real money and that's what happened. <laughs> Um, because essentially the strategy was overfit to the market within the back test. And so having out of sample data is a very important step in running any strategy that you wanted to invest in the market. And I can fully understand that for someone who does this professionally, waiting till you have out of sample is just painful. Um, for me, I was doing something else and all of a sudden I was prepping to come here today and I was like, oh my God, I have out of sample data. This is amazing. And I actually have 17 months of out of sample data. Um, and that's because I went back to Catalyst, I got the Fortune 1000 list. That's from the beginning of 2015 to, I'm sorry, the beginning of 2002 to the end of 2015. And then I manually updated it till May 1st, 2016. So I have 17 months of out of sample. This is uh, the out of sample return charts. So you'll see my strategy, this is the Fortune 1000 version. Um, top line returns 332% over this period. And there's a big difference on this chart. I've got, A, it goes red, turns red here, and there's this blue thing. And so um, this is actually uh, an open source library that our research team has created to evaluate time series of data. And it's basically looking at in sample and out of sample data. And that blue cone, I like to call it the cone of expectations. Uh, and our very smart data scientists look at the historical stuff and they've written some evaluation tools which basically say, did it perform as expected or not as expected to try and understand if things are overfit. And going outside of the cone of expectations too high, making more money than expected is as bad as going too low. 
because it means that whatever you were doing historically isn't carrying forward. So that's my strategy in out of sample data. I still get this one, your benchmark's still wrong. And again, uh, what I was able to do actually was um, take a look at the pipeline API. And remember I told you how Fortune doesn't wanna just give me their historical lists. I've tried, they're not interested. Uh, so I decided to go and try and make a version of the Fortune 1000. Now the Fortune 1000 is a little bit easier than the S&P 500 because it's not handpicked by a group of people. It's just the 1000 biggest companies by revenue. And so that same API that I showed before, uh, in theory, allows me to do that. And what this does here is it basically, it first, the first two parts here is I get a, a bunch of data. So I find out, is it the primary shares? Does it have a market cap or is market cap null? Is it a depository receipt? And I create a mask. I just wanna clean out all the junk that's not like a normal company in the market. <laughs> I then get the revenue for every company and I uh, rank that from top to bottom. And then I set a screen saying, just give me the top 1,000 companies by rank and mask out all of those things that I wanted to mask out. Now, I do a little bit more work here because what I actually care about is removing all of the companies that have female CEOs that I'm investing in and just looking at uh, the rest of the Fortune 1,000. And you'll notice when I do that, I call this the Quanto 1,000. No trademark infringement here. Um, <laughs> and uh, it gets a lot closer. Over the same time period from the beginning of 2002 to May 1st, 2016, there's only a 17% difference. And so that's interesting that, you know, the women are outperforming still, but not as sizably. And that brings me to the point where everybody says, okay, well, regardless of that, you've got a strategy that looks like it does pretty well. Are you gonna invest in it? Are you gonna live trade it? And I was just like two sessions ago sitting next to a guy that said, what are you talking about? And he goes, oh, are you live trading it? Um, and I, you know, cause when you have something returning two or 300%, <laughs> you, you, you wanna have money, money fights? Uh, snowball fights? I don't, I don't know, I don't know. Um, and in any case, the thing that I did, the reason that I hadn't been able to live trade it so long was that that Catalyst data set, I get it every year, which isn't frequently enough to have something that I can trade on a regular basis. I need a live data feed. So I took that code that I just showed you that's the revenue ranking to get the Quanto 1000. I took the code that gets me my event investor data set, which is getting the CEO changes, and put that to work. Um, building a strategy that's just changing, doing the female CEOs of the Quanto 1000 as they move forward through history. And that gives me, uh, again, decent returns over the time period, outperforming the benchmark, and this is starting to get to a strategy that I can actually trade. Uh, and I have actually started to put this to work, our version of this, against the um, paper trading, which is monopoly money. Uh, so it's using real market data, but not real money, because I, I don't have a lot of that. Um, <laughs> And in order to do that, I did some optimizing. Like, what's the best universe to use? So I've gone from the point of, do I believe that I have a decent strategy? Can I disprove my strategy to, okay, what's the best way to trade this? And one of the things I looked at was different levels of the Quanto uh, 1000. Is it the Quanto 500 or the Quanto 2000? Is more better or is less better? And interestingly, Morgan Stanley just released a report similar to this saying that the top performers uh, with female CEOs do better than even the l uh, lower performers with female CEOs, which I think rationally makes sense. But you'll see here that the, the female CEOs of the Quanto 500 do quite a bit better than the female CEOs of the Quanto 1000 or the female CEOs of the Quanto 2000. Um, the other thing that this strategy allows me to do with the event investor data is actually compare just the female CEO changes to the male CEO changes, uh, which looks like this. So I went with the Quanto 500 because that was the best performing company and looked at the female CEOs as compared to just the male CEOs. Now, interestingly, sample size continues to be a problem. Uh, the female CEO strategy here at its max has only about 20 positions in 20 different companies. And Ursula Burns, the CEO of Xerox, just announced she's retiring later this year. So my strategy will actually sell out of Xerox in a couple of months. Um, and if you go and do a blended version of this and just trade all CEO announcements, it only outperforms the male CEO strategy by about 3%. Because while the females outperform the males dramatically here, there just aren't that many of them. So once you put it in the broader thing, it's much different. So where does this leave us? <laughs> I've thrown a ton of different charts at you and I've talked a lot. Uh, and 
from my perspective, this has been a wonderful experience to learn, learn about my users. I've taken a strategy through the idea, through research, through testing, and into live trading. I've done the whole gambit, um, and I've learned a lot about my users along the way. I hope that it will help me make a better product as I continue to move forward with this, you know, building what we're building, which is really fun. But it actually goes a little bit further than that for me. Quantopian's at the intersection of two very interesting industries, uh, technology and finance, both of which are woefully lacking in diversity. They struggle. And in some ways, we're doing a really good job at this. This is our recent 24-hour period of our community backtesting. 60% um, of our users are not in the United States. So we have wonderful international diversity. We also have unbelievable diversity in terms of the people using our platform aren't finance people. So we've made allocations in mechanical engineers and in accountants, uh, in software engineers at big Silicon Valley companies, but not people that only work in finance. So we have diversity of ideas, diversity of people with different backgrounds. But by my estimate, we only have 4% of our community is female. And so our goal, the thing that we're doing is changing what it means to be a quant and who gets to be a quant, who gets to come up with ideas and have uh, people allocate money to them to invest in those ideas. And the goal that I have and the reason I stand up in here is because I hope that when we change the way this is done for men, we change the way it's done for women as well. Thank you very much. I did, I meant to point out, we used to, I, there are two different open source libraries here that we use. I was supposed to talk about that. Zipline, which is the back tester. It runs our whole platform. It's open source. Anybody can see it. There's a sprint on it later this week. So if you want to come learn more about Zipline, you can. And then Pyfolio is the risk analysis tool. We have a few minutes left for Q&A. So if you have a question for Karen, please come to the microphone. We only have one microphone on the Or go get here. lunch. Uh, thank you very much for the talk, Karen. Um, so you, you've picked a perhaps somewhat arbitrary um, uh, characteristic, right? Uh, yeah. Gender. You, you could have picked eye color or hair color or something like that. Why do you think women may or may not be mm, a tradable strategy? Like, it, you know, I, 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 one of the things that I can tell you is people ask me, like, does this mean women are better CEOs than men? And I have, I have no idea. Um, I picked this because I had the data, because it's personally interesting to me. Um, I have looked at trying to do something similar for race, and I cannot get the data. It's much harder. I mean, they don't have that. Um, I don't know why the returns are this way. I've heard a lot of theories that there are just fewer women that are accepted into these positions, that are asked to do these positions, so they just have to be the best. Um, and maybe if you looked at all people with, I don't know, red eyes who are CEOs, they would also be great because there aren't very many of them. Um, I'm not sure why this works out the way it does, but um, historically, I do believe in the validity of the strategy over time. I also think if we get to a point where we don't have the sample size problem, where there are 50% female CEOs, this strategy probably gets less interesting. Thank you. So did you happen to notice a um, bias in the data where you're going and sitting there and the price drops when it's announced, and then you make the purchase, so, and then the company actually recovers. That is very, very interesting thing. One of our interns last summer looked into exactly that um, and saw that there was a 20-day lag. So um, a female CEO is announced, and you can arbitrage money out of the market by uh, buying the company when it's announced and holding it for 20 days, which I consider like the 20-day cycle on rationality. Like, <laughs> oh my god, a woman's in charge. Well, that'll probably be OK. <laughs> um, but I didn't do any work into that. Another, another engineer did that work. Thank you. The other interesting one, although he told me he wants to do on this, is interim CEOs. Short anything with an interim CEO. Like, just short those companies. You do not want to be an interim CEOs. And I, uh, the version that I put into paper trading actually removes interim CEOs from my strategy altogether. Uh, one of the tricks people use to prove crackpot economic theories is basically cherry pick the start dates of their graphs. So did, have you tried changing the start dates to see if it works with you know, a wide variety of periods? Uh, do you mean changing um, when the start date is, like plus or minus after their actual start date? No, no, no. The, the time period over which oh. you evaluate the entire thing. Pe people will yes. say, yes, we can prove that. 
No, I do. I did in a previous version of the talk, I looked at like one year, five years, 10 years. It holds true over the time period. I also had a version that I don't even think is in my appendix where I just looked at the last year and a half, just the out of sample. Um, and my strategy, I think the female CEO's version of it outperforms the RSP by 3% over the last 17 months. Um, so it continues to perform, outperform, but not as dramatically. Obviously, the longer you hold, there's more option for it to do well over that time period. And there are some companies that start and end the entire simulation with a female CEO. So I'm just buying and hold, and it's a long buy and hold strategy on a lot of those companies. Um, so I've done a little bit of that, but yes. Uh, this might be a bit of a similar question, but um, like the, the Fortune 500, doesn't it change over time? So at the moment of buying, those companies were in the Fortune 500, and if they moved out of it, then you yes. wouldn't buy it anymore. That's true. I do not, the female CEO version does not take into account the, um, that the, they might have fallen out of the Fortune 1000. It's just the fact that they were in it ever. Um, and so that changes the comparison against the Fortune 1000 benchmark or the Quanto 1000. Um, the Quanto 1000, because the Fortune 1000 changes every year, I rebalance that one annually in June when the new list is announced. Um, but yeah, the female stuff, they could fall out of the Fortune 1000 but remain in my portfolio. So that, you know, benchmarks are hard. Um, that's one of the reasons why I like the RSP as the best benchmark to use mm -hmm. um, because it's just an equal weighted S&P 500 which is considered to be the market benchmark. Um, but yeah, that is not something that it does. They don't, they don't come out of my strategy when they're out of the Fortune 1000. All right. I don't think I'd have that data even. I, I guess we only have time for one more question. Sorry. <laughs> I'll stay around too. <laughs> Hi, uh, this is actually a question for my friend. Uh, he, I don't, I've never used your product, but he does. Uh, he was wondering if there's gonna be a plan to release, uh, I guess like a feature of options trading. So we're working on adding more markets. Futures is next. Um, international markets will be down the line. Options will be down the line. Um, but market expansion is definitely where we're headed. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Karen. I guess if your question was not answered. Can people ask yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Feel I'll free be here. to ask, talk to Karen if you, have question, if you have any questions. Thank you. Mm. I want to take off the mic, though. <laughs>